well, this is talk MariaDB security features. And it's an overview talk about uh, all the MariaDB, almost of MariaDB related security features. And just a brief, I'll describe every one of those features just briefly. And you can, and then there will be a link to the manual where you can read about it in details when you will be know what you need to look for. And there will be talks later in this security fest that will go in details about describing those features and how to use them. So first about me, I'm originally from Kharkiv, Ukraine. I live in Germany for quite a few years. I was a co-mysql developer from well for more than ten years, and those time during those time I was basically the security at mysql.com. That is, if you would have reported a, about reported security vulnerability to mysql to that email, it would be me who would have replied and it would be me who would have fixed this bug. Then, since twenty ten, I am I work in MariaDB as my, I'm a MariaDB core developer and also do basically. If you report a security vulnerability to security at MariaDB.org, I'll reply and I'll likely fix this bug. So I work in MariaDB Corporation as a piece of engineering and I'm a board member of MariaDB Foundation. So security. So well, dictionary describes security as <clears throat> a state of being free from danger or threat. Well, the, those days when I think about security, uh, it, for me, it is when, I don't know, when you can sleep in your bed, when a rocket don't destroy your home, when you can have enough water and warm food and have access to electricity and medical care. And But this is actually, yeah, that's not what this talk will be about. So this talk is not about security. It's about database security. And uh, this is a definition from Wikipedia. Database security it concerns the use of broad range of controls to protect databases against compromises of their confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And this is exactly what this talk will be about. I'll be talking about controls that uh, MariaDB provides to you that you can use to protect your MariaDB installation against compromises of its confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So let's start, and we'll start from the very beginning. When you fire up a uh, MariaDB client, uh, GUI client, command line client, web client, whatever. And it needs to connect, <clears throat> it starts connecting to MariaDB first, starts sending some bytes towards the MariaDB server, and MariaDB server starts sending some bytes back. And already at this point in time, you want this communication to be protected. You don't want any, you know, evil hackers to see the data that you exchange to modify your queries or database responses you want the connection to be protected. In MariaDB, this is done using SSL, that's secure socket level, and MariaDB can be compiled with OpenSSL, uh, any version from 1.0 to 3.0, or with WolfSSL, depending on what kind of binaries, MariaDB binaries you use. But just using SSL alone is not enough. You, it's not enough to know that your connection is encrypted. You need to know actually who has encrypted it. You need to know who your client is talking to. Because technically it's very possible that there would be some bad actor sitting in the middle between you and the server who decrypts all your connection and sends it to the server unencrypted or differently encrypted. And this way, even though you as a client think the connection is encrypted, it's still perfectly available for this bad actor in the middle for reading or modification. So you need to know, you need to be sure that the connection is encrypted all the way through the server. And that is, you need to verify the server certificate using this command line option, a still verify server cert. Unless you use it, you cannot be sure that your connection is actually protected. It might only be, it might appear to be protected, but unless you verify the server certificate, you cannot be sure that your connection is actually protected. So this is a very important option to use to be able for the client to verify the server's identity. That can also work the other way around. There is a way for the server to verify the client identity by using a require clause in the create user or alter user or grant. For example, if it's a big organization that can issue its own SSL certificates, then the server can use then one can use create user require issuer 
on the server. In this way, the server will verify the SSL certificate of, of the client, and then only clients with the certificates issued by this, well, organization-wide authority will be able to connect to the MyDB server. So this is the way for the server to verify the client's identity. And the last uh, item point of this slide, we've had, well, it's not a hypothetical thing, we actually have had those users who periodically change, they have policy that every certificate should be changed, well, every now and then with some specific frequency. And, but, and so they replay, they regenerate and replace all those certificate files, but they do not want to restart the MariaDB server to start using new files. And that's why we implemented this command flash SSL when issued, the server will reread all the SSL certificates and will start using new certificates for all the new connections. This way, like one, can you implement a SSL certificate rotation without well, restarting MariaDB server. So next step after the connection is established, we need to, to tell MariaDB server who we are and to prove that this is we are who we are saying we are. Basically, we need to authenticate ourselves to the MariaDB server. Authentication in MariaDB is delegated to authentication plugins. The server itself does not authenticate anything or anybody. It invokes uh, some authentication plugin to do the authentication. Uh, I'll describe only, there are many of them, I'll describe only three most important, well, from my opinion, plugins. So there are, the, as this slide said, and I was saying, the best, uh, the best password is, well, the most secure, the best password is when you don't have any password at all. When you don't need to type the password, you don't need to remember the password, you don't need to write it on a post-it notes, nobody, but nobody can see the password by looking over your shoulder. You just don't have any password and still magically the server knows who you are. This is exactly how this Unix plugin, Unix socket and name piped on Windows plugin work. They only work if the MariaDB client and MariaDB server, they actually run on the same computer, either the control of the same operating system. But if it is, then you don't need to prove yourself to MariaDB server because MariaDB server can simply ask the operating system, who is this, well, process connecting to me? And then, so if you have logged into your, I don't know, Linux box or your Windows session, then MariaDB server can ask the Linux or Windows as what user you have been logged, user you have been logged in, and then allow you access as this user because you have already proved yourself to the operating system. And this is very important because it provides basically best possible security and without any additional activity from your, from your side, you don't need to type any password. It's also very convenient for running script, SSL scripts, well, SQL scripts, because you don't need to store the password plain text in a file or in a configuration file or on the command line or anything. You just don't need any password at all. So it's also very, very convenient for scripts. And that's why all MariaDB installations starting from version 10.0, I guess, use Unix socket by default for the root user. But also, it's of course, Unix socket itself is not enough because very often you also need to be able to connect from a different computer, not from the same one. And that's when we cannot trust the operating system. We cannot trust the other computer, so we need to, MariaDB server needs you to specify the password. And in this case, the recommended plugin is the ED25519. This is a modern authentication plugin that uses digital signature algorithm based on elliptic curves. And it's basically the most secure that we have. That's it. The server doesn't get the user password never in no way, shape or form. There's nothing on the wires and no network packets that can help to recover the password. There's no data stored in the user table that help to require the password. There's no information that the server itself obtains during the authentication that can help the server to require the password. Even if the server is completely compromised and is running fully under control, some evil control of the bad guy, they still won't be able to get your password. That's basically, that's, as far as I understand, there's no other MySQL plugin that, or MariaDB authentication plugin that provides this property. The only way basically to recover the password is to brute force it. And the third plugin I want to talk about is the PEM plugin. It uses, it works on Linux or Unix and uses PEM, a pluggable authentication module subsystem. 
And it's a very, very versatile plugin that allows you to do lots of very interesting stuff. So the most, probably the most uh, popular PEM, most widely used PEM module is PEM, PEM Unix. And if you use that for MariaDB, then you will need to type in the same password that you would be typing when logging into your Unix or Linux box. But we have actually seen users using PAM WinBin, that is, authentication MariaDB, authenticating users in MariaDB. Again, the Windows NT domain and a PAM Google Authenticator that allows you to do use two-factor authentication when you know you have this app on your phone that generates one-time passwords in addition to normal MariaDB password. And uh, believe it or not, but I have actually seen users using PAM fprint that's authenticating using fingerprints. And we had users using PAM Secure ID, which is had Secure ID, uh, RSA Secure ID hardware tokens that you have seen on the slides. So this is very, very versatile plugin that allows you to do lots of different strange and interesting things. So when you authenticate to MariaDB, you actually authenticate using one of the authentication plugins. But this is not all. Since ten, oh, you can also tell MariaDB, configure a user account to authenticate using multiple pl authentication plugins as alternatives. And MariaDB will try them all in order until at least one of them succeeds. This is very important, for example, in for the MariaDB root user that I just said that we by, by default use Unix circuit for MariaDB root user to provide, to create a protected MySQL user root account, MariaDB root account that still does not need any password, which is great, but it might be, but it might be needed to connect to a MariaDB root account from a different computer, or maybe you want to connect connect to a MariaDB root account without being well system root, without using sudo. For that, you would need to specify a password, and this is exactly what we did. In if you install MariaDB now, you'll see that the root user uses Unix socket or MariaDB native password. That is, if you connect as system root, you don't need any password at all. But if you want to connect as non-root user or you want to connect remotely to MariaDB server as root, then you would need to specify a password. You're get basically getting the best of both, both worlds. Another possible use case for this alter mul alternative multi-plugin authentication is a migration. For example, you have a MariaDB server and lots of different mission-critical applications connecting to it and working 24-7. You don't want to turn them off. And you decide to move them from the old MySQL native password plugin to the new ED25519. You can just, well, re replace the plugin for all the users because all the applications will stop working. And if you start changing password on those applications, then again, after you change, the application will stop working until you update the plugin. So what you can do instead, you alter user to use ED25519 or MySQL native password. And from that point in time, applications can authenticate using both, both passwords, well, either of them. And then you can slowly, one by one, reconfigure those applications to use the new authentication method, the new plugin. And after you have fixed all, the, all your applications, you can alter user again and then remove MySQL native password. And from that point in time, all your applications will be using new authentication. So this way by using, well, book two applications, two plugin authentications alternatively, alternatively. You can slowly migrate your applications one by one without downtime. I've just, so next point, point bullet point. I've just said on the previous slide that basically the only way to recover the password if ED25519 is used, is to, bullet, is to brute force it by basically trying all the different passwords until you guess correctly. To prevent that, you need, to, you need all your users to have strong passwords, not like one, two, three, four, five, and to, for, to force users to use strong passwords, we have password validation plugins. We've developed three password validation plugins the probably recommended one is the CrackLib plugin. It uses libcrack that you most likely already have on your Linux system. It's installed by default and it validates your password that you just use using password command. Password command. If you don't use it, CrackLib works by comparing 
making sure that password is not in the is not a dictionary password. It comes with a dictionary of possible English words and looks in them. If you don't want to use it correctly, there's also a simple password validation plugin which just verifies that the password contains uh, at least the configured number of digits and computation characters and lowercase letters and uppercase letters and all those unknown rules that you get on certain websites when you want to create an account. And we have also password reuse prevention validation plugin which remembers all your previous passwords that you have used before and it does not allow you to create a new password that would match one of your previous passwords. It has a configurable history depth so after a certain configurable number of days it forgets all two old passwords, but within those history depth, it will disallow you to change the, to the password to something that you have already used before. And the last point, bullet expiration, it's a controversial topic. So it was something very popular like, you know, 20, 30 years ago. More recent security guidelines often say that password expiration does not improve the security and maybe even decrease it. But there are also guidelines that say that it helps. And there are also organizations that have policies that require password expiration. So if you believe that password expiration helps, or if you have to use it because of some internal or external policy in your organization, you can use password expiration in MariaDB using syntax like on the slide. Or you can specify, so you can specify password expiration per user, or you can do it global system-wide for all users. And what will happen if the password was not changed for like in this example for more than 130 days and the user will still be able to log in using the new password uh, old password but the user will not be any will not be able to do anything else until they change the password that's how password expiration works so this was all about authentication we've authenticated ourselves to the server and now the server need to decide what our privileges we have what are we able to do and that's called authorization and this is done, with, this is configured with Grant Revoke. And Grant Revoke was in MariaDB forever and in MySQL since, I don't know, for more than 20 years. I'm sure that everybody knows what Grant Revoke is, and I'm not going to talk about it to save time. I'll talk about newer stuff. And one is splitting of the super privilege. So there was a super privilege that allows to allow to do lots of different things of that were vastly unrelated to each other and just basically anything that did not have any better fit and privilege was put under the server and it was not good for security because you cannot allow users to do something fairly innocent like show binary logs without allowing to do them fairly heavy stuff like specifying arbitrary definer and that's why we split the super into many fine-grained privileges. I don't have a full list here, they wouldn't, it wouldn't fit on the slide, but you can see that in the manual. And just for example, what was cheaper before and now is called bin log monitor. This privilege allows you to do monitor your binary logs. It allows you to do show binary logs or show binary log events. And also what was cheaper before and now is called a sets user privilege. It allows you to create a start procedure or a view and specify a definer equals and then arbitrary definer. And this is very powerful privilege because you can create a storage procedure and they say definer equals root. And then you can run it as root basically. It allows you to do any SQL command as any user. So it's a very powerful thing and you should not give it to just anyone. On the other hand, show bin log events, oh, show binary log, for example, it's a very innocent privilege, doesn't allow to do much. And it was not logical that both were under super before. And the second thing uh, related to authorization is uh, roles. It's a skill standard feature called roles. We have it for quite many years, but it's still um, underused and not fully understood. I believe that's my impression. So let me quickly give an example of how roles work. And this example on the slide, there's some fictional organization that has three roles, well, roles, I mean, in logical English sense. People who are database administrators, uh, data analysts, and finance department. And database administrators have full access to system data and 
finance department have read and write access to financial data, and analysts have only read access to financial data. And we have six employees. So we could have granted uh, directly correct privileges to every single employee. But in this example, I've created three roles for data access that they need, data read, data write, and system full, full access, I mean. And three, three people roles, admin, analyst, and finance, and granted correct access level to every individual role or position. And then those roles to individual employees. And why would I want to do that? It's because it's much easier to administer. It's basically it's for easy, easy, ease of maintenance. Let's say, for example, we wanted to hire a new employee, Grace, into the finance department. department. Instead of granting all the individual privileges all over again to Grace, we can simply gra grant finance to Grace, and then she'll automatically get all the necessary access level. Or, even better example, for example, we decided for some reason that we want database admins, DBAs, to have read access to the financial data. I don't know why, but this is an example. We have two database admins, Ellis and Bob. So normally we would have need to grant this access both to Ellis and Bob. In this case, because in this example, because they're both admins, we just need to grant data read to admin and they automatically get the necessary access level. Meaning you only need to grant access once. We don't need to have grant the same access to many different people over and over. So it significantly reduces the chance of making a mistake and granting, for example, too much privileges to somebody who shouldn't have had those privileges. So this is for ease of administration. And now after we have uh, connected and authenticated and got the necessary authorization, we can access the tables and read and modify the data. But uh, this is all great, but down below under the hood, if you go really, you know, down to a level of file system, all the data are still stored in files on the hard disk somewhere. And if the, somebody would be able to get access to those files and just copy files away, or, you know, steal the whole hard disk, just unscrew it and take it over from the computer. Then all the day, one would get access, full, full access to all the data with, uh, without any SSL, without authentication, without any authorization, just directly. One would be able to just get, get complete access to the data. We wouldn't want that, would, would we? So to prevent that, we can encrypt the data using the data address encryption. This prevents access from anybody who didn't pass through all the previous levels which I've just described. So what does data address encryption encrypt? It encrypts in a DB and area tables and logs. It encrypts binary logs, temporary tables, and files, temporary files. Basically everything that gets read into disk is encrypted. That's why it's called well, data address encryption. Data encryption, data address encryption can work globally, like encrypt everything of in a DB. Or it can work per table when you specify specific tables to encrypt. Or it can encrypt, or it can encrypt uh, everything in a DB except a few tables. You can also do that. The point is that encryption, it's, well, it's reasonably fast. It's few percent. You lose few percent of performance. But still, it takes some CPU time. And if the table does not contain any confidential information, like you have a table with, I don't know, uh, state holidays in Germany in 2022. There's no point in encrypting this table, it's public information. Encryption keys are identified by the uh, key identifiers, and you can have different identifiers, key identifiers for different tables. That is, you can, have, you can, you can encrypt different tables with different encryption keys. And also, data trace encryption supports key rotation, meaning that at some point in time, you can change the encryption key and MariaDB in the background transparently will re-encrypt the table using the new encryption key. And when it's done, then you won't need the old encryption key anymore. And encryption key and key rotation also works for per table ID, so you can per key ID, so you can have different rotation policies per, for different tables and different keys. For example, most sensitive table you can rotate the key like every day or every week and less sensitive tables, you can rotate the keys every month. And non-sensitive tables, you don't have to encrypt at all. You can have very flexible encryption policies this way. But where the keys are coming from, 
the keys are stored in some well, key storage, and it, it is again completely delegated to plugins. MariaDB itself does not store the keys, it asks plugin to do that. And we provide three key storage plugins. That's called key management plugin. Uh, that's plug file plugin which stores encryption keys in a just plain text file, which you can also encrypt, otherwise it would be pretty silly to store unencrypted keys on the disk next to the encrypted data. So you can encrypt this file as well. You can also store encryption keys in AWS and you can store them in HashiCorp vault. Okay, so all that I was talking about, it was mostly about our confidentiality, about keeping your data private. But in this definition at the beginning, I also said something about integrity. Integrity means that nobody can change your data. And you don't necessarily need to read the, to read the data to be able to change it. You can just go to encrypted file and modify some bytes and suddenly it'll decrypt to something different. And we don't want this to happen. So we need to also ensure data integrity, not only data confidentiality. And data integrity is achieved using checksums and authentication encryption. For example, in DB tables and logs, they have checksums per page and temporary files, they use authenticated, authenticated encryption to prevent data from being modified. And the last word on those definition of database security was availability. I'll very briefly talk about that because we are running out of time. So we don't want some user to connect many times to the database, take up all the possible connections, eat up all the memory, use CPU up to the 100% so that nobody else could use it. That would make database unavailable and it's not good. So there are a few controls that you can use to prevent that. There's max session mem used uh, variable. It limits how much memory one connection can use. You can use that to prevent one user from eating up all the server memory. Max statement time limits how long uh, one single statement can run. Again, you can prevent this. You can use to prevent a user running many run, 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 run away multi-hour statements and taking up all the server. And max user connections limits how many connections a user can have at the same, simultaneous connections you could have at the same time, any single user account. You can specify them global, globally, as, as first bullet point shows. You can specify them per user using create user or alter user or grant statement, like in this example on the slide. And max connections, it limits the total number of connections by all users. Unlike max user connections, limits number of connections per user, per account. And max connections limits total number of users total number of connections for the whole server. It's, it's needed to prevent the server from being overwhelmed from using up all the file descriptors. And if somebody still connected that many times and the server becomes unavailable, there's a connection admin privilege, which again, also it was super before, but now it's, it was split into a separate connection admin privilege. If a user account has a connection admin privilege, it st still can connect one more time, even if all max connection connections were used. And then this user can use his admin powers and kill few connections and free up possible connection pool and make the server available again, thus, well, improving server's availability. So that, is, that was about availability and all other stuff I was talking about related to security and confidentiality and integrity. This is basically all documented in the knowledge base. You can start from this URL that I have on the slide and hopefully it'll also be down below under the video. Someday when they'll put it online and that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Sergey, for your talk. Um, much appreciated. I'd like to start off the, the questions by going back to what you were saying uh, at the beginning of the talk, you were talking about the, the plugins that MariaDB does offer. Uh, Obviously, they're extensible. Um, what would you do if you wanted to write your own kind of authentication? We have uh, a documentation on the knowledge base that describes how to write uh, authentication plugins. I believe, well, it was years ago, I also have a blog post on my talk about how to write a PAM plugin like in 15 minutes. I was giving talks about that, so it's generally it's very easy to write an authentication plugin. 
Okay. Um, there's authentication isn't the only plugins we've got. Um, you mentioned password validation. That's I guess another yes. plugin API. Um, is yeah. there any other ones in the security realm? Any other what? Any other plugin APIs that people could Related to the security? Yes. Yes. Uh, key management plugin that are, provides encryption keys for the data address encryption that I was talking later in the presentation. Yep. Yep. True. There's that one. Um, I guess there's also that audit plugins uh, that, that wasn't really covered in security. There's an aspect of do it, doing audit logging in audit plugins available as well. Yeah, uh, yeah there, well, there are other plugins, but not. I was only talking, this is what I was talking about security. So I was not talking about plugins, okay. plugin types which are not related to security, like data types and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's certainly a lot there, and I certainly don't want to enumerate all this. Um, the data at rest encryption, you covered that, um, that it's possible to do key rotation uh, through um the the mechanisms um how would you do like a key rotation on say binary logs as you're replicating to another server we <clears throat> with our binary logs there's uh there's no code to re-include binary logs because it uh, kind of happens naturally binary logs are happened only so if you rotate if you change the key then Starting from a specific point in time, my log will be used a new key, and all logs will be my logs will be replicated and then purged normally. Okay, so the, that's the point. But there's no that. specific there's no specific code to re-encrypt existing binary logs. They're just well replicated and purged and deleted as usual. On the other hand, in a DB table, it's not deleted; it's here to stay. That's why there is the code to re-encrypt. In a DB table, to get rid of all the So, and that that's almost like an alter table on to a different key ID. No, no, it happens uh, in the background transparently by a separate thread, and it's done slowly so that extra I/O wouldn't affect your normal operations. Okay, cool. So, but yeah. there's information schema tables that allow you to monitor the progress and know when the old key was completely removed. Okay, good. Um, on the integrity, you were sort of saying you can't change a byte here or there. Um, you still can like replace an entire NADP page, can't you? Or is that um, tied in um, to some other cryptographic area? So uh, this was. I'm trying to, I will answer the question that I think I understood. So about integrity. So <clears throat> one thing with integrity is, you don't, it's not necessarily part of confidentiality because you don't necessarily need to understand the data to be able to change it. For example, many, there are many encryption methods where you have source data and you generate a uh, Super random data, then you basically took sort of original data and this super random data, and then you get encrypted data. You cannot restore the original data without knowing what you have sorted from. But if you can sort the result with something, and this way you basically change the original data without knowing the. Ah, uh, yeah, let's see. Yes, so this way you can reasonably modify the result. The, the source data without no without being able to read it. because after you sort it with the same encrypted data you'll get the original modified original so it's very important to be able to ensure that the data are not modified by anybody even if you know that nobody can read that read it somebody still might be able to modify it without being able to read it and this is this is integrated checks they they prevent that, and in, in the DB, for example, there are checksums on the tape, on the pages, and in binary logs there are checksums, which are also included, so you cannot modify the, you cannot recalculate the checksum. And in temporary files, we use authenticated encryption that I uh, go account to more that I wrote on the that I wrote on the slide. 
which also calculates some kind of uh, data after the everything. And you cannot modify the data without modifying this result. This okay. Cool. Um, but it's really, you know, great to see, you know, roles um, highlighted again as, you know, the easy way to do um, privileged death um, granting in a um, controlled way. So um, thank you for the reminder of that, and we'll try to promote that more. Um, is there anything at the end of the talk that you think, oh, I should have covered more? Or <laughs> yeah, Obviously, there's a lot there. Uh I don't, I, well, if I would have had more time, I would have went into more details explaining how to use every individual feature with use cases and everything. But within the time frame that I had, I only just wanted to explain, to show what the features are and so that it won't answer all your questions about security, but you will know all the words. So you will be able to, to ask, it will know, provide all the answers, I mean, but it will, give you all the words, you will be able to ask the right questions. And you, if you can check the manual, you will know what keywords to look for, you will know what to Google for. And hopefully there will be talks, other talks in this manifest that will go in details into individual features and show specifically how to use them to, well, to provide the protection that you need. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your talk and thanks for your time in the Q&A. Much appreciated. Thank you. Welcome to Galera Cluster Security Presentation. I am Seppo Jakola from Codership and working with the MariaDB Galera Clustering on a daily basis. Uh, Here is the agenda for this presentation. Uh, practically four topics. Uh, when I was uh, first asked about uh, to give this presentation, I thought that there is not really much to say about the security in Galera itself because everything that is uh, implemented in MariaDB proper for security uh, it should be applicable to to color clustering as well but there are some topics first of all the cluster topologies they can have a big uh, impact on, on how secure your clustering is uh, how the communication between a cluster node happens how it's configured it has a really big imp impact for security then there is this uh, data REST encryption, which was uh, implemented for MariaDB 10.1 and now finally supported by a color replication as well. That is, a, uh, let's say, the first of the real security enhancement that was uh, implemented by color for MariaDB clustering. And finally, node screening by IP allow list uh, is quite new uh, feature we are in, uh, at the moment of implementing it for MariaDB 10.9. Okay, MariaDB versus cluster security, as I said, the, all the um, security related enhancements in MariaDB are practically available also in, in Galera cluster. Galera uh, is just a bunch of uh, MariaDB nodes and each node will uh, we'll use those security features that are developed in, in the uh, MariaDB itself natively. But due to the distributed topologies, there's much more communication and there are more open ports to take care of. So these are the topics that we are uh, focusing in in this presentation. Uh, first about the topologies, maybe the best, um, sec most secure presentation comes from uh, the, I call it here a corporate style network architecture where you have a proper uh, demilitarized zone uh, for public accesses and, and firewalling then protecting uh, the outside world's access to the uh, front-end service that you have in BMZ and then behind the firewall you can finally access the MariaDB nodes in Kalera cluster. So this is the way how to do it and then you can control that uh, who has uh, uh, access to, to MariaDB Kalera cluster and you could you have can be more relaxed for example, by the security of these nodes itself. Geoclustering uh, and more and more uh, deployments happen in, in cloud environments and uh, also in a wide area networks. Uh, quite usual, there is a uh, need to replicate between two data centers, for example. And if this happens in plain text, 
then uh, you are uh, vulnerable for uh, man in the middle attacks, attacks here. So for that reason you should always enable TLS encryption for these connections. This is uh, how the topology looks when uh, when you have uh, configured segmentation so there are not that many uh, connection lines between uh, oh, through the open uh, public network uh, but if you don't use segmentation then all pairs of these MariaDB nodes they have to have uh, connection to each of the other node on, on the other side. But basically the encryption works the same way so it's a TLS configuration and, and nothing else. Uh, and finally, there's, it's, there's always possibility, of course, to use VPN gateways, uh, and with that, you could all, if you have VPN gateways between your data centers, you can, of course, also use plain text replication inside of the VPN gateway. So that is something that uh, quite a lot also happens. This kind of topologies. Uh, and finally, the cloud lib deployments. There are many variants, of course, those different. Uh, uh, cloud providers. Uh, the bottom line here is that I don't dive in more into these topologies, but uh, uh, the safety of the deployment is based on, on the security features provided by the um, uh, cloud provider, and you, you should take care of that uh, yourself. Uh, then the cluster communication. So, how, how much communication happens between nodes and, and clients uh, in, in the cluster? First of all, there's client-server connections. These are native MariaDB connections. Then we have a node-to-node -node connections, which are replication connections, uh, carrying out the transactional replication uh, data. And uh, finally, the SST uh, state snapshot transfer connections, where a joining node uh, asks for the donation of a database contents. And this big bunch of uh, database conte uh, context will be then transferred over the network, so that is quite vulnerable states, of course. Uh, okay, first client to server connections, so these are native, all native, and Calera cluster does not uh, actually interfere with the MariaDB client and server communication at all, so whatever you have uh, uh, configured and use, using for authentication or uh, privilege control or uh, encryption it's it's readily usable in, in color cluster itself um, and TLS, TLS of course is is the main security for this type of connections then replication connections so connections between nodes uh, the recommendation is to use always TLS <coughs> for these connections and this uh, actually happens to be default now also in MariaDB enterprise versions probably coming to uh, community as well. Uh, for establishing uh, uh, a TLS in, in replication connections, you first uh, it's based on X509 certificates and you need to get these certificates for all the nodes in the cluster. So if you have a readily available private key infra infrastructure, you can use uh, certification or authority from there. And if you don't have it or don't want to use it, you can uh, always create a uh, so-called mini CA uh, for cluster itself uh, and then copy this mini, mini CA uh, certificate to all the cluster nodes. This is quite common way to, uh, to uh, configure the TLS for color clustering. So with this type of uh, encryption you, you get the encryption but not the authentication. Uh, uh, the authentic authentication is based on uh, more or less like a shared secret. So those nodes that have the necessary uh, CA certificate, then they can uh, join the cluster. And if you keep that in, in safe place, then uh, you also minimize the probability of an uh, intruder to entering in, in a cluster. Uh, and here's a knowledge base document about more details here. Replication connections, they are uh, TLS is configured win, uh, for uh, replication VSREP provider options. So we have additional configuration there about these certificates and keys. Uh, in order to use TLS, you have to configure every node in a cluster uh, to use TLS. So there's not, it's not possible to use partially so that you would have some connections in plain text and some, some with TLS. That's not possible. And now there's quite recent MDEF that is fixed uh, 22131, which uh, uh, implements the dynamic upgrade from plain text replication to TLS. 
Uh, SSD connections, as I said, so these are the uh, connections where a new node uh, joins to the cluster and asks uh, sends a SSD request to get the full database contents sent over. Uh, the two principal methods how to how to do this are rsync or maria backup uh, so these are the relevant ones and you just configure uh, tls for them in uh, in a mariadb configuration file in ssd group and there you just give your certificate path and and after that uh, uh, the ssd connection will go through uh, s tunnel so it's a, a tls encrypted connection and again, a knowledge page document about more details here. Uh, there's one catch with the configuration uh, VSREP SSD out parameter. It's a parameter where, where you give the uh, uh, username and password. And that is in, in as I said, in a uh, configuration file. and. Uh, Yes, there, there has been some concern that should that password be plain text and of course that is a vulnerability we have a mdev about it uh, right in the bottom line uh, so it should be fixed at some point currently it's not uh, but if you use maria backup and this ssd out it's so only needed for uh, maria backup ssd where uh, we need in the donor node in inside the donor net, node have a local connection uh, to the database server from the backup script itself. Uh, but Maria Backup, uh, it has, uh, there's, it's possible to have use certain authentication plugins where you don't need to configure this uh, authentication uh, uh, informa information in the configuration. So if you're using that, then you are not uh, actually giving any, or uh, let's say you are not uh, affected by this vulnerability of plain text uh, password in, in configuration file. Uh, then about the ports, so native MariaDB it's, should have uh, only one port open to the public work 3306. Uh, uh, but when we come to clustering, we have three additional ports, the replication port 4567, and uh, then we have the so-called IST port, which is incremental state transfer, where we send uh, uh, it's a lightweight SSD. Uh, it's using a separate port for that purpose. We are sending Chica's uh, events through this connection. It's using 4568 port, and then for SSD traffic, uh, currently 4444 is the default. These ports are all uh, default values you can configure to whatever you like, uh, but uh, eventually, whatever your ports are, you will need these four ports and you need to configure that for your firewall policies and uh, other server security control utilities like uh, SA Linux or Hubbard or whatever you have in your system. Uh, and again, a knowledge base document about more uh, details about this. Data at rest encryption. Uh, so it's a mm, feature where you can encrypt all data that is uh, uh, remains on, on disk, on, on file system, uh, statically. Uh, and this feature was added in MariaDB first time in version 2.1. Uh, again, knowledge base document about uh, how it actually works. Here it, how it looks <coughs> uh, from the MariaDB server side. So you have a uh, uh, elements that are in uh, main memory in, uh, like uh, the biggest bulk is of course the InnoDB buffer, buffer pool then all client thread related stuff and bin lock caching and so on and eventually something will be written to the disk and for InnoDB you have uh, data files and redo lock files and also bin lock files and the data at rest will uh, will take care that everything that is on disk should be uh, encrypted properly but when color replication steps into the game, uh, it basically reads from the log cache uh, replication events that happens in uh, in main memory. It stores them in in color cache Gcas called Gcas and then replicates between the cluster uh, all the information that it has stored in Gcas. Um, but in order to uh, 
support uh, uh, changes in the in the replication traffic uh, we cannot estimate that how large this gcash will grow therefore it has been implemented as memory mapped mile file and it has an uh, also file uh, a part in in file system gcash file which can be a several gigabytes in size uh, when the encryption is enabled, that happens so in MariaDB 10.5, one world, uh, maybe my slide is not very uh, well uh, showing this, but this uh, IP data, redo lock and bin lock, they are now uh, dotted, so it means that they are encrypted, uh, but GCAS uh, main memory structures and file was not, so that was the state in, in MariaDB 10.1. Uh, in 10.4 we implemented GCAS encryption and there uh, we have uh, also the main memory part and, and file system part is, uh, is also encrypted. Uh, for the encryption itself uh, we use the same uh, keys and key rotation that MariaDB is using. So color replication is just delegating the, uh, the need to encrypt and decrypt uh, whenever it writes to GCAS or read from the GCAS, it, it will do the encryption and decryption. And same keys uh, then available in in, uh, in color uh, encryption as well. Uh, it was added in, in MariaDB Enterprise Server 10.4, but now that uh, the new features are coming from Enterprise to Community Server, I would uh, expect that this will be also in Community Server. Uh, I assume it's not yet there. I'm not following that closely about what happens in, in the release contents. Um, but anyways, you should be aware that uh, if you don't, if you are using a version uh, where uh, the GCAS encryption is not yet present in your color server, so if you have using anything l lower than 10.4, you have a kind of a hole in your encryption. It's not fully data at rest encryption system. So you need to take care of that uh, before you can claim that you have uh, TD in place. You have to have color enterprise or waiting for the community server uh, version to have this. Okay, then about uh, the final topic is about the SSD as a scene as a security hazard. Uh, it's because uh, joining node. Uh, Whoever can join the node, uh, you just need to have access to the networking and uh, send an SSD request to one of the nodes. And uh, if you are being served, you will, as a return, you will get the full database content. So that can be seen as a, as a security hazard. Uh, but this can be mitigated for, uh, to begin with, with the network topologies. Uh, so if you have proper firewalling, then you can control that uh, who in the first place has access to the uh, to the donor node in your cluster. Uh, and then again, if you if you have and you should have TLS configured for your replication uh, traffic, then you also will have uh, TLS uh, uh, X509 certificates uh, as a shared secret. Uh, and if the intruder does not have access to this certificate, he cannot join. But then we have a third extension or precaution for controlling the SSD donations. It's a node IP allow list feature. It's now uh, a pull request for this feature has been submitted for MariaDB 10.9. In, in a nutshell, it, it implements or adds a new table in a system repository MySQL VSREP allow list and it just contains a list of IP node IP addresses and this is the list uh, where uh, only these uh, connections coming from these IP addresses are, are allowed to join the cluster. Uh, the Jira issue for this or the task, it happens to be in MariaDB Enterprise. It's meant for to five, but in principle, it's uh, the pull request is now re already in, in MariaDB 10.9 Community Server Edition. Here is the animation how it works. So we have uh, two nodes in a cluster currently, nodes 11 and 12, and then they have a low list which has place for uh, free IP addresses 11, 12, and 13. Mm. And an SSD request is coming from a ill-behaving intruder uh, who tries to steal your data. Uh, 
Uh, but because uh, his IP address does not match this table, then uh, it's, it's not getting anything from this cluster. But then if you have the proper node, so the node 13 is joining back, send an SST request, it can join. And uh, during the SST, we also send the, uh, the allow list table. So all the nodes will at all times have the, uh, the correct um, allow list, the same uh, allow list. And this is also an InnoDB table and it's replicated. If you make changes to this table in one of the nodes, then uh, the changes will be replicated and the cluster will always take care that the uh, correct allow list configuration is, is in place. All right, that's all from uh, Galar cluster security in MariaDB. Uh, I first thought that not much content, but it turned out Yes, there really is, and uh, and more is coming. The more more security related features are in a, in a pipeline. So thanks for the presentation. I'm watching. Uh, hi, Sepo. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, and uh, now I will ask you a couple of questions. Uh, first question: uh, You said about the node-to-node uh, -node connection that uh, replication connection has a TLS as a default in the enterprise. Uh, why not in the community server uh, where by default there is no uh, encryption enabled? Uh, hi, Anel. Yeah, thanks for having me in this presentation uh, about the default values. Uh, uh, overall, all the features that we actually implement for MariaDB, uh, both enterprise and community edition, uh, uh, they happen through uh, feature requests, which are handed over to our organization. Through, if they go to community, they are end dev uh, tickets in Jira, and if they go to enterprise, we have a ment category tickets. And for some reason, this um, uh, just changing the uh, the, uh, the plain uh, plain text uh, communication to replace it by uh, uh, a, a kind of recommendation to use TLS or always and have a TLS as a default configuration. It was only given us for as a as a request for the enterprise edition. So that's simply the answer. I believe that now that uh, all the features eventually will go to the community server. So this default setting will be uh, taken in, in, in place also in community okay. edition as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, in your talk, you, you spoke about the dynamic upgrade that is uh, recently supported from uh, unencrypted uh, to encrypted node uh, to join the cluster. Uh, is that hard to configure? Uh, I have seen the pull request. It is just uh, saying that the socket dynamic should be true. And is there any downtime uh, to that? Uh, yes, this um, the configuration is is like you said, and so that, that's not a problem. This um, uh, change it uh, or the upgrading it, it was also given us a, as a uh, feature request from Mar MariaDB side and uh, 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 the use case or the, or the requirement to have this was that uh, there are uh, users who were previously using plain text communication all over in the cluster and then the need to have a more secure uh, installation deployment uh, came into place, but uh, there are some some uh, deployments and clusters uh, where it's very hard or difficult to to get the uh, service window when you could take the cluster down. So there were there are users who would appreciate that you can can do this kind of changes, which is uh, as a hot online uh, operation. And for this this reason, this requirement was was given to us and now with uh, with this configuration you can just do it uh, node by node and when all the nodes have switched over to the tls communication then the uh, cluster eventually will also use tls only and in, so, that, in that regard also the question how tls uh how are tls downgrade attacks uh, mitigated uh in, in in that context yeah that's um yeah it would also allow you to uh to, sw to switch back from uh, TLS configuration to plain text communication, but that, that was not the use case. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, that would be a very bad choice <laughs> to yeah. do. But it's possible. I mean, uh, and uh, that would be... Yes, yes, it's possible. Uh, actually, I'm not quite sure if the, 
I must check it, check it from my notes of, of from the engineering. It could be also that the cluster uh, reject this if somebody wants to go back to plain text in the middle of the operation. So I'm not quite sure if it's rejected already. If it's not, it it should be rejected. So it's a, uh, it's not at least it's not the planned use case for the cluster. So the only idea of this uh, implementation uh, was to that you move on this direction from plain text to TLS and then you I stay see. in TLS. I see, thank you. Uh, regarding the SSD communication, uh, how donor node will react in case there are IP allow list in the TLS? So we know that the uh, uh, IP allow list is added in 10.9. There is the pull request. So now the question is uh, how IP uh, allow list and TLS uh, work in conjunction? Yeah. So that, uh, as you said, this allow list, it's a, it's a new feature. So we have a pull request uh, uh, against 10.9. There were some, uh, some change re requests coming after that. They were answered last week. So from our point of view, that allow list feature is now ready for 10.9. But whether it goes there or not, it's it's not depending on us, on us. So there are many other features coming to 10.9, and whether 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 allow list will be there or not, we will just see how it goes. Uh, this is a kind of separate. Uh, uh, a security feature where you can screen out some certain nodes from joining the cluster. The TLS uh, certificate is the first one. So if the uh, joining node doesn't have a valid certificate to join, then it cannot even handshake uh, with a donor node. And so it's not it's not possible to uh, to do anything with it in the cluster. Uh, if it has a valid certificate though, so he has gained the a valid certificate and joins. Uh, then after that, uh, the allow list is checked. So that whether whether the configuration allows uh, to sending SST to this uh, IP address is is verified. So that's the uh, way how it, how it's planned to happen. Thank you. And uh, you said the, in your talk that there are more security related features uh, in Galera pipeline. Uh, can you have some? Uh, quick peek about that. Uh, yeah, basically all the all the new features they will arrive in uh, in in the Jira. Uh, so after the switch to have all features in in community, they will be MDLs in Jira and uh, actually just reading all all what is there, uh, it can be verified what's going on. At the moment, we have open open tickets which will be addressed quite soon. One is the uh, X509 certificate uh, revocation list support so that uh, it would be possible to uh, to revocate some certain certificates from joining the cluster. That's one that we are going to take a look at. Cool. Another one which has a quite old one is that uh, in the configuration file uh, we have this uh, VSREP SST out uh, parameter where you uh, you're supposed to give your username and uh, password in plain text for for the SST process to uh, to locally connect to uh, to the local server and then uh, uh, use this information for uh, for um, MariaDB backup SST. So this plain text uh, password was seen as a security vulnerability and there's a the same dev about this so that it should be uh, uh, somehow scrambled. The actual design for this is not yet implemented, but uh, as I mentioned in the, in the presentation, so there are authentication plugins where you don't need to do this. So if, uh, it could be that uh, it mitigates this, this problem okay. for many at least. Cool. Thank you. And uh, at the end, uh, uh, how can users uh, request uh, security features or provide contributions uh, to Galer? Uh, well, the contributions and, and security features, they, for Galera, they happen in the same way as the MariaDB proper. So there's no actually no difference. Uh, submitting a, a Jira ticket through MDEP, it's, it's the uh, preferred way. If there's a concern of a security vulnerability, that's uh, better to uh, 
then go privately uh, through our engineering or through MariaDB engineering so that uh, so certain bugs don't, uh, uh, it's better to not have publicity for for certain vulnerabilities if something like that would would raise up. Uh, for okay. color part, I must say that these vulnerabilities have been quite rare. We have uh, fixed or phase two CV level uh, vulnerabilities which were fixed. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Seppo, for your presentation, and uh, thank you for uh, great uh, answers to questions. And looking forward to see uh, Galera uh, improve it, improvement. Yeah, thank you. Thanks thank you. for having me. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye. All right. So, hi, Jeff. Welcome to MariaDB manifest on security. It's a pleasure to have you here. And I'm very excited to hear what you have to say about uh, what it means to uh, consider security as an economic model. So, uh, Jeff? It, it's great to be here, Vincent. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm excited to. And, and you know, mini-fest, maxi-fest, you and I will always have a fest. Oh, definitely. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. You know, I, I again, I approach things a little bit differently than most people, and I, I like to think of things in, in a different way. So let's start by, again, reintroducing me. This, this is me. I'm Jeff Hardy, a product marketing manager focused on a hosting segment for Acronis. There's my contact information. Not going to waste a lot of time talking about it, but if you want to ask me any particular questions or ask for a copy of the deck when we're done, just shoot me a note. I'm happy to send you whatever I've got. So let's go ahead and start talking about what I mean here. All right, this is a famous painting. Uh, this, this was done by a, an artist named René Margritte. And in, in French, it says, this is not a pipe. Now, why is this here? Why would I put this here in a presentation about cybersecurity, okay? The reason is because what René Margritte was telling us is that the, when you abstract something from its reality, it's not the same thing anymore. So it, it creates, you know, whenever we abstract an idea out, it changes how we think about it. And that's a bit of a problem because abstraction, when it comes to security, abstraction becomes a distraction. Uh, what is abstraction? We all know this, you know, we, in development and in software and in the internet, we think of in abstraction diagrams sometimes. We draw these things out to try to get an idea about how something moves in the, in the, in the ether. But what it does is abstraction is a way of dealing with concepts that are separate from their underlying value or street strategic or physical reality, right? So the term security for us is real is actually too abstract. It doesn't really give us like, you know, we're doing, I'm doing security today. I'm doing cyber protection today. It's a little bit too abstract. It, but then we, if we drill down too far, we get into the tactical day by day things of what we do to make our job happen. In this case, make security happen. You know, so you got the too abstract on one end, right? And you got the too detailed and granular tactical things of cybersecurity on the other end. And what we really need is something that's in between, something in between those two, so we can think about things perhaps a little bit better. That's the first thing that introduces the idea that we're going to be talking about today. The second thing is, if you're in software development at all, you've been hearing the term shift to the left, shift to the left. You know, uh, traditionally, you know, long term, I've been around a while ago, the gray in my beard. I've, I've been around a while in this business. Traditionally, security is something that we deal with at the end after the project has been done. You know, this, this is the history of, of development. You build your application, you make sure it works, and then you go through and you fix the security in it. You, it's sometimes referred to treating security as a bug. You, you, you build your application and then you take and you fix things afterwards like you're fixing bugs, right? The shift to the left trend that's going through all of our lives right now is to not do that. It's, it's to shift the idea of security and cyber protection left in your project plan so it becomes more important. It's something you deal with earlier on in your product development cycle. And it, it's good. We all want to do that. So we're going to talk about shifting to the left and shifting to the right. Hmm. What do I mean by that? So these are two ideas I wanted to start with. There's another idea too. This is another big idea that frames the way I think of cybersecurity, right? 
The Godfather, right? We're going to make you an offer you can't refuse, right? Famous movie, right, Big? But why am I doing this? It, 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 you know, another thing, why is this here? It's because there are fundamentally, Jeff has his five plus one axioms of cybersecurity, five plus one. And it begins with an important one, Jeff's five plus one security axioms. The first, cybercrime is a business. No matter how you slice it, no matter how you dice it, it's a business. For some, for some cyber uh, hackers, it's their core business. For some of them, it's a side gig. It's a side hustle, right? But for everybody, some way, it's a business. They get something out of it. The second axiom, there's no such thing as a completely secure system, no matter how good your security, no matter how good your encryption, no matter how attentive you are. Something that I was always keep in the back of our brain. Number three, any system, no matter, no matter how simple or complex, is subject to compromise if and when the economic potential gain exceeds the cost of committing an, a, a compromise in either time, effort, or money. Think of that. You're pretty safe until the value they can get from hacking you exceeds their costs in hacking you. That's the way I think about it. Number four. The cost of technology, the cost of technology, and thus the cost of technological crime continue to drop over time. Everything gets cheaper in technology. Chips get cheaper. Resources get cheaper. Bandwidth gets cheaper. It's, it's, and that's not going to stop. Technology crime gets cheaper. But at the same time, the value of any technological system tends to increase over time. You know, when I was the hosting company, we saw this all the time. A website would start and it would be maybe a gig worth of data on a website. After three years, there's six gigs worth of data there. There's just the, the, the whole amount of the website would just increase naturally over the course of the time. Any data that's in your database, if it's valuable to you, a year from now, there's going to be more data, not less. God willing, there's going to be more customers, not fewer customers. So the value of any system goes up. So the cost of technology goes down. That's the cost of crime. And the value of your database and your systems goes up over time. Two important more points. Thus, the conclusion is the best way to address security in any system is to consistently, persistently, increase the costs of committing a successful compromise or a breach. I'll just go ahead and read it. While consistently decreasing the ability of criminals to derive economic gain. That's the, that's the core fundamental way of how I think about this. And, the, and then the little plus one there is the axiom. We have to remember this. Economic gain is not measured in money alone. It's also measured in utility. You know, and we understand this intuitively at the government level. Sometimes governments, you know, don't care about making money off your data. They, they care about making, you know, using the intelligence they gather from you. Um, sometimes uh, cyber criminals just uh, want the props. They want the the reputational benefits of, of, of being able to penetrate a system and acquire the data. Sometimes it's for political reasons or ideological reasons. All those still are still economic reasons why they commit their crimes, right? They're just not based upon money. All right. So I've just laid a big blanket of groundwork covering the worlds of art and all the way to world technology to lay a couple ideas on you to show you what I mean. So let's talk about that. A basic economic model of cyber protection. We want to shift to the left and shift to the right. You want to be thinking about security when you build your database from ground one, and you want to continually do uh, practice good economic policies that continually shift time to the right. So let me walk you through it step by step. This is a representation of what's called the cost curve. In economics, we call this a cost curve. This is what we talked about before. The cost of technology and thus the cost of cybercrime tend to decrease over time. There are exceptions, but the rule is it goes down, right? New 
uh, uh, exploits are discovered. Um, you know, new code is written, new techniques and tactics, new fishing techniques and tactics are discovered over time, right? Things get easier for these guys. The costs, uh, uh, you know, we've even seen people right now, there's a thriving market in reselling malware uh, back and forth. You make a small change, now it's yours. You don't have to write malware from the code up anymore if you want to be uh, you know, a cyber criminal. The costs of all these things go down over time. Likewise, the value of your systems, no matter what your system is, if, if your systems matter, if your systems have value, that value is going to tend to go up over time. So in an economic model, we're going to call this a benefit curve. So we have a cost curve where costs are persistently going down over time, and we have a benefit curve where the benefit they all derive from hacking your system is going to go up over time. So let's just say hypothetically, this is where we are now, right? We're sitting here right now, okay? But time is, time is persistent. Time never stops, all right? If we get to this intersection, this is what I was talking about. This is the, the economic model way of thinking about it. If we get to point number one, the value of hacking your system or, or compromising your system is going to be bigger than the cost of actually doing the compromise. Even while we've been having this conversation, time has been marching. We're continually going in this direction. If we get here, we have a problem. So all, those gro all that groundwork we laid down here, right? We're now focused on getting down to the, not, the dirty. This is, this is where it really comes to, kind of clicks together as an idea. We have to move the cost curve, all right? So instead of just thinking generically and abstractly about improving your system security, think about moving the cost curve, making it more expensive for people to attack you over time. How do you do this? Here are some basic ideas, basic approaches, ways that we approach increasing the cost curve, okay? First of all, You've got to apply your application, whatever application you're using, in this case, MariaDB, but it can be any application you use, apply good security best practices as a, as a rule, not as an exception, as a rule. Make sure you're updated and patched. These are all things that are going to make it harder and thus more expensive to be attacked. Uh, improve cyber detection, the intrusion detection. Um, uh, Minimize the number of vectors. So this is a pet peeve of mine. You know, essentially, we haven't talked about this in detail, but I have literally uh, done uh, screens, both uh, efficiency and, and performance screens and security screens of websites. And I have found websites making over a thousand external API calls. And I just go, I just, I just don't understand. And you and you drill down and you see that hundreds of them are no longer valid. The system the code is still calling out sometimes the systems that no longer exist because they've, they've, they've never taken the old code out and they just left it, added the new code, the new apps and the new widgets and the new thing, services in, they've never taken the old things out. So what happens in situations like that, their, their attack surface area, their, the, a, a number of vectors just continues to increase over time. So a good policy is you always make sure you are cleaning up your code People's APIs change, make sure you remove the old APIs, right? Whenever possible. Sometimes you can't, whenever possible. Uh, when it comes to websites, you know, you uh, you go from one marketing application to another, make sure you fully remove all the code and calls and APIs from the old app or plugin that you're using before you install the new one. That, that's the concept behind it. Anyway, minimize vectors whenever possible. Harden your perimeter. This is basic uh, data, uh, basic uh, data center uh, uh, security, um, and then also, believe it or not, government plays a role. You know, uh, increase civil and criminal penalties. And make sure that the word gets out. These are all things that, uh, and there's more, but these are all things that increase the cost to the criminal of attacking you and your system. So what we do? What happens? The cost curve shifts to the right and you gain time. Your new intersection point has moved to intersection two, right? This is where now you are. And, and you can see, because no system is 100% secure forever, what you've done by increasing the cost, you've shifted the curve, you're shifting the intersection point, you're now safe, for, relatively safe, 
for more time. The next thing you need to always do, see, this is never what think about it. All right, not just security. We're going to shift the cost curve. Now we're going to shift the benefit curve. We're going to shift the way that it changed the way uh, any potential cyber criminal is going to benefit by trying to compromise your system. How do you do that? Well, here are some techniques that shift the benefit curve. First of all, make ransomware moot. Uh, it's self-serving. That's that's one of the main functions of, of a Cronus. We can take and put you into a ransomware proof situation. Proactive scanning. Uh, uh, what does this mean? This means that either real-time scanning of your system looking for intrusions, intrusion detection, um, uh, also uh, uh, maybe scanning your backup, something else that we've done a lot, we do a lot of. Next, improving your response. The faster you respond to, the, to a detection, the uh, less potential benefit somebody has to gain. Accelerate disaster recovery. Take away the ability for somebody to take you down for a protracted period of time. Advanced encryption. And also another way, another way governments can participate and help us all is to accelerate legal enforcement. Sometimes it takes too long. So what do we do? What happens with this? This makes the cost, the benefit curve also shift to the right. The point moves to point three. And now you can see that by shifting the cost curve, and the benefit curve, we have gained time and made ourselves not an attractive target. We are now more expensive. We are maintaining that distance. So it's persistently more expensive in time, money, resources, effort to compromise our system than it is the value that may potentially get from us. All right. So am I, am I splitting hairs? Well, what I'm doing here is I'm taking this out. What happens a lot of times in people's heads and, and that I've noticed is they say, okay, I'm just going to practice cyber protection. I'm just going to practice internet security and they'll just do certain things. They'll get caught up in the tasks. But I think it's kind of a better approach, especially if you're looking out when you're making your plans for the year. If once every quarter or once every you know, uh, a half a year or so, you moved your cost curve to the right and you moved your benefit curve to the right, that is a better way to think about it. Consistently move both of those in that direction, all right? So this is an economic model of cyber protection. And just want to quick mention before we get into the question and answer part, I know that you and I will be talking uh, in, a, in a couple of weeks, right, Vicente? And we're going to be talking in detail about some of these tactics and deploying these things out on April 20th. And if you want a link, I'm sure we can provide it. So. There you go. Uh, and since that, that's the essence of, of, of my economic model. What do you think? Oh, um, very good talk, uh, Jeff. Uh, thanks for this. So I definitely agree with it. And I actually have a very um, interesting question um, following this. So the, the way you put it, uh, you're um, describing that a system is effectively um, gets mo more and more secure the more holes or security holes you patch from it, correct? Yes. Um, but what I think happens is that a system is no more secure than its weakest link, correct? Correct. So um, would you say that uh, in order to benefit the most and, and shift both the cost curve and the benefit curve to the right, uh, one should tackle first looking at the lowest hanging fruit, uh, but never forgetting that the whole system needs to move as a whole, otherwise you're just leaving other low hanging fruit behind. 100% agree, uh, and, and, and you're, uh, you're, you're spot on. You know, the, uh, what you decide to prioritize you know, is equally important, right? Uh, I just need to make, we need to make sure that you tackle both sides of it. So, you know, again, I, I would say that, you know, uh, in our previous conversations, we, we discussed some of the low hanging fruit is just like the way you deal with passwords or go passwordless, right? You know, the way you set up some of those best practices that you and I have discussed several times now, you know, that is, yep. that should be, that's really easy. Well, it's com comparatively easy than some of these other approaches. And you should always start with the basics. Um, you know, as they say, walk before run, right? Um, but the, the yeah. mentality you have, if, if your data means something to you, is that you have to always attack it from both the, co the cost curve side and the benefit cur curve time curve side. 
so that uh, you're always increasing your margin. Let's call it a margin of security. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, I get that. Um, what uh, actually surprised me a bit is you mentioned that uh, over time, the cost of hacking you for, from the attacker's perspective gets lower. And I, I would have thought that it actually gets higher because with more powerful servers, for example, if I want to do a denial of service attack, I would probably have to conjure a much bigger fleet of robots to attack your website. Right. Do you think that is true or is that just part of the picture? Great point. So, so l- let me, let me, uh, you're, you're correct to a point because like the, the line that I have, the cost curve lines that we're talking about right now, the cost curve line, and I'm, I'm representing it here as a straight line, right? But nothing mm-hmm. in the world of life or economics is a straight line. It, it, it goes, it, you know, it's, it's up and down, it's up and down, it's up. But the overall trend for the costs of technology is going down. And, and, and let me project out, um, because I can tell you a specific point where the cost of cybercrime is going to crash to near zero. What's Jeff talking about? All right. Okay. So, uh, so, so it's true. What, what happens is, is, is uh, as more and more, uh, uh, as, as, if I'm a cyber criminal, if I compromise uh, a bunch of printers or a bunch of, you know, who knows, other internet connected devices, let's say I uh, baby monitors or whatever, and I get them to launch a DDoS attack against your system, and I figured that out. I now have tens and thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of bots out there that can I can unleash upon you. Well, then what the manufacturers do is we learn from that and they plug all those security holes, right? Uh, yeah, but so my, my cost was going down. It went down to near zero. Plugging security holes made my cost go up again. I may not use that tactic again. I may look for a hardened target. But it's going to ha- but the overall trend is going down. So one of the things that's coming up in the what's the I'll call it three to seven year time horizon um, quantum computing quantum computing all right because what's going to happen when quantum computing takes hold and and the, I've I've been examining some of these projects they're working on it right now we're right now uh, to to uh, to to uh, uh, the amount of processing power that it takes to do a brute force attack on something is very, very high because everybody's really, really, even though the price of processing and the price of resources continues to go down, everybody's on board for that. So you have to buy more and more processors to to take and do that attack. But when quantum computing becomes available, the price of compute power is going to just drop through the floor. Um, and, and then as, and so when that happens, I, uh, the, I think some of the first people to take advantage of it, we, we think, we hope that the first people to take advantage of it are people who are doing like machine learning models to help, you know, solve uh, uh, climate problems and to, <laughs> and to, and to, and to model, you know, traffic flows and to uh, model DNA profiles to help make us all healthier and happier. But I think that equally so, some of the first people to take advantage of this technology are going to be the cyber criminals because it op- it it opens the door for them to take and 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 redo attacks they have not been able to afford to do in quite a while, and so that's what I mean. So the the the, the cost of attack is not it it's linear, but it's not smooth. It's going up, it's going down, it's going up and going down. But the trend over time is that it persistently gets less expensive. Does that kind of clear up the idea? Okay, yeah, that makes more sense. And I, I think I cleared up the the point for uh, people listening as well. So thank you very much for this one. Sure, sure. Now, uh, another, another question I had is, well, you obviously had quite a bit of experience with uh, Inacronis with helping people do disaster recovery, get their data back. Uh, the, the more data you have, usually the more expensive it is to hold backups. And is this just a... Uh, let's say the cost of doing business and that you have to uh, keep pumping in more uh, more resources to make sure your data is safe and backed up? Or do you have uh, some better suggestions here? Uh, Acro- you know, Acronis solutions can be deployed in the Acronis cloud. They can be deployed on- on-prem. They can be deployed into a, a second, uh, even a, a-, a third-party data center. And, and all those, I mean, I, I say the number one thing is to make sure that you're fully protected. This is interesting. Okay, so let me let me kind of address your question a different way. You are correct. Mm-hmm. The more data you are, are are backing up and protecting, the more expensive it's going to be. But even that, over time, 
you know, I think that all all costs of technology eventually drive down, you know, go go down over time. But yes, it will. But it's like this. If he's saying, okay, well, you know, if I have, you know, seven bricks of gold, you know, and then I get eight and I've got to buy a bigger safe, you still got to buy the bigger safe, right? Um, the you know, a, a data has been called. Um, I, in fact, I heard uh, I'm quoting somebody. I wish I could give them proper attribution, but so I'm just going to go ahead and say it. I heard one person call uh, data the uh, the new oil of the cyber economy. In other words, where oil was such an important part of the industrialization, that data is now that that value point. I heard somebody else say that data was the currency of the internet age, meaning that uh, you know data is the real value, and people even trade data back and forth as if it was money. Um, so. What we're talking about is protecting, you know, especially in the world of databases, we're talking about protecting what is ostensibly our most valuable asset, you know, um, uh, and uh, all software depends these days upon data. Every every SaaS app, every customer, every time, if you have customers, you have data and it's your most valuable asset and the cost of protecting it properly is the cost of doing business. And it's actually, I think it's a fiduciary responsibility of everybody who's running a business online. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah, and I, I agree. And although it's not necessarily the um, the answer you want to hear, you, you would expect to get, oh, no, don't worry, it's just going to get cheaper. Uh, I think it's uh, it's good. It's good to know that this is something that just grows with the business, basically. But there are basically the systems that are in charge of making sure they their data is secure or should be in charge uh, can uh, rise up to the task so yeah yeah uh, you, that, you know that's good news I, and it's it's important to be proactive i, I agree uh, let me say it another way too you know uh, if in the world of business i mean let me think of, just if you think of this uh, like on my on my uh, um, i have car insurance right I, I drive a car i have a car i have car insurance so that if i get in an accident right and because I've uh, uh, I've got other insurance policies and I've got a good driving record, these are all things that make my insurance policy less. More and more, we're actually getting very determined and quick calls from potential customers because um, even their insurance companies are recognizing that making sure that you have a proper balanced cyber protection model pulled in is critical and they won't insure them as a business unless they've got all these things in place. So everybody recognizes that there's a, there's a cost to basic cyber protection, it's a cost to it, but that, uh, that overall, the, uh, just because, just because uh, risk is invisible doesn't mean it doesn't have a cost assigned to it, right? And so the more we eliminate risks, the more we reduce risks to businesses, believe it or not, the cheaper your overall costs of a business are going to be whether it's insurance, whether it's because eventually that catastrophic event can occur. Risk, if it's there, if, if you address the risk in advance, right, then it becomes a quantifiable something that you can build a business around. So I hope I didn't get too ethereal on, on that response. No, I, th I, I, think, I think it makes sense. You, you don't need to uh, prevent it from happening. It's not a question of if it will happen, it's when it will happen. And when it happens, you need to be prepared for it. So I agree. That's yeah. That's basically what this yeah. is. So, so stop them as much as you can. Have the fire sprinklers and the fire alarms, and and have all those things prepared. And but in the case of a fire, make sure you get the fire department. Oh yeah, yeah. That's that's actually one of the things we we, we talk about a lot during our talks. And that um, unless you test your system, you're not. It doesn't work. So right. uh, always make sure to test your backups, make sure the disaster recovery actually works, not during a disaster, but before the disaster happens. Yeah. Otherwise, it's going to be a complete disaster. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah it, uh, it, let me just interject real there. You know, that, that's so important. And, you know, uh, it, it's going to sound remarkably self-serving, forgive me. But, you know, one of the coolest things about, you know, the Cronus solutions is that you can at any time just go in and look at individual files. And you, and you can examine in the database where you can just examine the backups for individual tables uh, and you can just see it in real time. So testing your system has never been easier. And, and uh, so I, I just, I'm, I'm just throwing that in there because it's, it's, it's a really cool solution.
No, that's that's actually uh, good to know that you, you have this. And actually, I'd be interested in hearing maybe uh, now in the future, or if uh, people have suggestions now, uh, is there anything in MariaDB that would benefit um, security aspects in the future? As uh, I'm thinking, uh, uh, is there? Uh, so you mentioned about the, being able to scan for intrusions. Would maybe some information schema tables that show different information be useful? So wow. I, uh, I don't know if you have an answer now, but um, I, I don't. But uh, I like maybe the, people who are listening could. Yeah, yeah, I don't. But I like the way you're thinking. You know, it's uh, it, uh, it's an interesting idea. So uh, yeah, let's get let's get the community involved. Get them get them contributing. Yep. So I I even got some ideas uh, already. Um, I know that there are people who are now um, logging the queries and then they're running some sort of um, regular expressions on them and trying to see, oh, is this potentially a credit card number that sneaked in in clear text? Hmm, okay, I, I should flag this. And uh, these sorts of things are tools that help you patch well, basically security holes. They can be in the application, they can be in the database. But uh, yeah, basically all of these are um, very important to to cover. You know, that, but, that, uh, oh, with that said, no, I, I I like that. So, you're, so you're, that's actually a pretty cool idea. So you so you know you're you're thinking about using some uh, smart detection, you know, uh, in inside the database to take and, and flag uh, natural. I'm going to call it naturally hazardous or naturally attractive data. Yeah, um, basically yes. Yeah. So you you should be able to look for patterns of how the database gets accessed and clearly mark that this is a potential security breach. And I can think of different scenarios, like when you're uh, in a data warehouse, you have people generating reports for you. Maybe you don't want, um, or you, you want to know if a report contained sensitive information. Uh, and you might want to double check that to make sure nothing was leaked unintentionally. So all these sorts of pattern matching, and I, I'm sure we could think of some AI solutions for this for sure. Well, yeah, you can also let people, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, whatever their highly sensitive data is, whatever whatever they define it to be, you can let them self define it. Say, you know, uh, identify anything that meets parameter A, parameter B, parameter C. If it does, flag it as a potential leak of sensitive data. Yeah, yeah. It could even be oh, boolean. That's an right? idea. It could just be a boolean string that somebody could say, you know. You know, the, the cool thing is in MariaDB, we have a plugin architecture. You can actually code this and make it part of MariaDB as a plugin, part of the wow. audit plugin, perhaps. Huh. So um, here's some, some ideas for whoever wants to get their uh, coding hands dirty. <laughs> That's right. There we go. So, so now, now we have, a, now we have a, a pull request for the next major release. All right. That, that would be so awesome. <laughs> Great. Wonderful. All right, Jeff. Um, I think we're getting uh, close to our time here. So thank you very much for this presentation. I'm sure everyone here tuning in uh, enjoyed it. And I'm looking forward to hearing any questions from the audience, if we have any. And other than that, thank you very much for this. It, it's my pleasure. I, I always enjoy your interactions. And MariaDB is one of the most exciting uh, projects out there right now. And, and I love working with it. Awesome. Thank you, Jeff. Cheers.